uh, I'm going to. Yeah, I got that. Okay, good. Apologies, Thank you. Paul. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, a um, number of years ago, uh, a few years ago, Len sent me uh, a huge document that was so huge that I decided not to open it. <laughs> it was the garrison files. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, then every now and then I said, okay, well, uh, I was doing uh, a lot of work on the Fair Play for Cuba committee. And I asked myself, well, what does Jim Garrison have a file on the Fair Play for Cuba committee? And uh, anyway, that got me to start reading, a, you know, file by file. And I mean, he has literally thousands of pages. And often those pages are, and these pages that we can find in those files include news articles of the detain. <laughs> so what you have to understand with uh, Jim Garrison is after he lost the trial against Clay Shaw, he kept doing research. And those files don't stop in 1968 or 1970. They go into the late 70s. And the House Select Committee on Assassination tapped into his research and talked to him, and he helped them out. So uh, what's really interesting in those files is a lot of people discount them because, you know, um, Jim Garrison was the, uh, you know, the subject or the target of a demolition campaign because he was so good and so dangerous. And it became toxic. I have very good researchers who've written in me and said, you know, Garrison had an agenda. He, he, he just so wanted to win the trial and so on and so forth. And these are really good researchers who are telling me this. But I think what we have to do in our, we, we're too quick to label people. We shouldn't label uh, individuals. We should look at the documents and the messages. Someone you don't like can still have great research. And that's, uh, I don't dislike uh, Garrison. As a matter of fact, I, I, I'm a big fan of his, but that's besides the point. When you go into the files, you see his interviews, like interview documents with subjects. You see polygraph reports. You see articles. You see lists of names. You see the research he does into organizations like the International Trademark. Okay, so one of my objectives today is to um, get you really interested in those files and maybe uh, get you to order them from Len. Uh, Len uh, and I, I suggest you contribute, you know, if you do get them, because uh, uh, I know Len doesn't ask for that, but, uh, and he, he, he would, I would have said this whether he were here or not, but uh, those files, I think um, the problem I have is they're so, so numerous and so thick, and I'm seeing names that I don't recognize, that, but I know other people would. Uh, I think the future of research is really going to be more and more crowdsourcing, like they do in the pharmaceutical industry. You have competitors who are sharing their research to get the vaccines out quicker, to get the pills out quicker, and you name it. So the, the, the you know this idea that uh, you know we'll hold on to research and we'll jealously uh, you know keep it ours, uh, it's it's not going to serve anyone. I think uh, if some of you could order those files and go through them. And uh, I'll show you, and I'm gonna show you samples today of things that I found interesting. And hopefully when you look at them, you, you, you will see the reason why uh, they're worth going through. Sometimes you'll only find one or two things, but they're, you know, they're slam dunks to prove something, or they'll really reinforce uh, some, some ideas or they'll add depth to your research. Uh, you have to be careful with these files. It's not because you will see a witness who said something that it's a fact. We know that witnesses can make mistakes. Witnesses, uh, you know, they can just be wrong. Sometimes they could be red herrings. Uh, and, but you'll also see in those files, Jim Garrison's thinking because he has an awful lot of um, writing directly on the documents. So he underlines things and he says, oh, this is interesting for this reason. Okay, and then you'll see some of his reports and you'll see some of his investigators reports. So there's so much variety in those files on such a variety of topics, whether it be Jack Ruby, 
whether it be uh, Clay Shaw, whether it be Dean Andrews, uh, you know, so he, he, he the, the thing with Jim Garrison is that he didn't close any doors. He knocked on every single door possible and he kept knocking after he lost the trial. And um, it, it, I find it just a wealth of stuff and I'm happy I read it. Uh, I suspect that I've missed a lot of things. I've missed an awful lot of points uh, simply because you, you, you'll read and then uh, 2,000 pages later, you're going to say, wait a minute, this theme seems to be coming up again. And if you haven't annotated those earlier files properly, you know, you have to go back and read things out. So it's, it's, it gets complex, but I, I've made my own lead file of over 300 pages taken from, I would say, seven or 8,000 pages of, uh, of documents. Uh, so yeah, that would be one of my goals today is to interest you in the uh, garrison files. Another one, to be honest, is just a network. I think that it's time that, uh, you know, we stop seeing uh, we got American researchers, Canadian researchers. No, we have researchers all around the world. And uh, if I ended up in the documentary, it's largely because I was able to get a lens interest in my research and Jim DiEugenio. So Jim DiEugenio, who is a friend of Oliver Stone's, at one point, two years ago, I got an email coming back from my cottage saying, hey, Mr. Blow, would you come down to Washington? We'd like to interview you about your prior plots article. And at the end of it, it signed Oliver Stone. So I don't know what I did for the next five minutes, but when I got up off the floor, uh, I uh, answered positively that, uh, you know, I would go down. I didn't care whether I was paid, not paid. It didn't make a difference. I just wanted to go down to Washington, meet a great, great movie maker and documentary maker. And, uh, you know, through the networking, uh, you know, I was able to focus on the three plots, uh, you know. And I, I also gave a lot of advice to Jim, I think, you know, on that I, I'm happy to see, in a, you know, one of the great things with... Um, uh, JFK revisited. I have not seen the four-hour version, by the way. I've seen the two-hour version. The four-hour version, we're having trouble in Canada for now to, to get it. I don't think, Len, you've seen the four-hour version, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but I think it's becoming available uh, soon. Uh, but uh, one thing that really impressed me in the documentary is the archive footage they show. And when you look at the archive footage, I had an article on that. It was about how the investigation insiders, okay, the Tannenbaums, the Sprague's, the Schweikers, uh, you know, even, even uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, come on, the last HSCA in, uh, head, uh, Robert uh, Blakey, even, even they are on the record. And even some of the, um, the uh, Warren Commission uh, researchers and, and leaders, they're on the record and you can see them in that documentary saying, hey, you know, we didn't believe in the single bullet theory, we didn't believe in that. So it, this isn't a QAnon conspiracy, conspiracy theory. We're actually really on the side of the historical traces. If you look at the HSCA conclusions, if you look at what the insiders say, and what, you know, those who were the closest to the investigation, they sound a lot more like us than they sound like uh, Posner or uh, uh, Bugliosi or, or even the latest guy Litwin, okay? They're the ones who are out on a limb like that, not us. Um, so yeah, no, I think uh, I'm looking forward to net networking. I think that the more we listen to your work and, and, and feed into it, and the more you listen to BOR and you read the Kennedys and King, uh, and the more we pool our resources and we send one another documents and, uh, you know, uh, the better it will be. So um, that's, those are my goals. Uh, and so what I thought I'd do is uh, let me, I'll show you uh, some of the really interesting pieces from the Garrison Files. And they're going to be part of an article I'm writing for Kennedys and Kane. I'll show you also a very interesting chart that I did. Maybe you've seen it, but for the prior plots article, because um, Bart and Tony, I think you were mentioning that uh, I, I, Neil, that I, you know, I covered the three prior plots, but it, it's actually up to nine 
or 10 alternate patsies. Okay, so uh, alternate patsies, in other words, people that had credentials really similar to Oswald. And, uh, you know, so it, I started off with three plots, but then it just started piling up. And I said, oh, wait a minute, who's this guy? And who's Harry Power? And who's, um, trying to think of the name, Santiago Garriga? And, uh, and, and I'm, I was getting these names and these profiles, a guy called John Glenn uh, from Indiana, not the astronaut. Uh, but anyway, so I, I have a final chart I'll show you that's not from uh, the Garrison files. Finally, I'd like to talk about three phases of research. Uh, the first phase for me, uh, when I, you know, when you read the initial researchers, what was it more about? Like if you look at the early uh, Mark Lane and Sylvia Mahar and, uh, and some of the earlier researchers, basic message was, boy, was a Warren Commission, did they get it wrong? They didn't do a good job. The second phase that really hit hard, I think with Gaetan Fonzi and Garrison was, oh no, there's a conspiracy. Okay, there is a conspiracy. We can prove there's a conspiracy, a shot from the front, uh, you know, uh, doctor, you know the, the Parkland doctors showing there's triangulation of fire and so on and so forth. But I really think we're now landed at the phases, the phase of saying, here is the nature of the conspiracy. Here are the persons of interest. We shouldn't be fighting even, you know, saying, oh, no, let me talk about the backyard photos or the, 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 Gar the Zapruder film. That, that to me is just a waste of time uh, at this point. All the better if we have it. But we should be talking about who played what role. And some people that are doing great work on the Miami side, in my opinion, are people like Larry Hancock, Bill Simpich, uh, Newman, and people who are doing a great job, who've done a great job on the whole uh, New Orleans side. Uh, you have people like uh, Jim DiEugenio, you have uh, William Davies, you have uh, Melanson, you have Joan Mellon, and you know, then you have the whole Jack Ruby profile, but how is all this fitting together? And if this should be able to end up in sort of, in my opinion, we should be within a year or two able to do a, a um, data visualization. Okay, so if we could get on a huge screen, something that says, okay, here are the persons of interest, here are some roles here. You know, we're not gonna get it exactly down to the shooters, or the, but we should be creating uh, a NORG chart saying, here are the key persons of interest. I think we're landed there. That would be the third phase. And that's the phase that I'm more focused on. Okay. And it's brought me to be really interested in a person like David Atlee Phillips. Um, remember the names of the Rodriguez family. Okay. Rodriguez being the person uh, that ran that school, that uh, language school, who led Oswald to meet Ringier. Well, his father and brother are so linked to the CIA and have their stories in the Oswald affair. They, there's their presence is in Mexico City, their presence is in Miami. There's one who was clearly in Cuba as an agent. Uh, anyway, that, that's a, an incredible uh, area that uh, Larry Hancock and, and Bill Simpich and uh, Newman have written about is the Rodriguez family. Um, yeah, okay, so let me, let me uh, maybe use that to start off. And uh, I'm going to share a screen now and talk to you about, talk to you about the, uh, the garrison files. Now, does everybody see this document? Yeah, yeah we can uh, see that, Paul. Yeah. You, you see it, Tony? Good, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know this piece was referred to in the JFK film, okay? So what it is, right, is uh, when Clay Shaw was arrested, right? Uh, he was arrested relative to conspiring and entering into an agreement or a combination with one or more other persons for the purpose of committing the crime of murder of John F. Kennedy, bail. $25,000, okay? And 
the arresting officer, his name is a bit complicated. It's uh, someone called Habergost. Uh, he's questioning Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw is extremely nervous. Uh, he's a little bit absent-mindedness. He's he, absent-minded. He's, he's probably thinking of what he's got himself into. Well, I mean, if you scroll down, right, to line 10, there's a question where he's asked, do you have any aliases? And he answers Clay Bertram, right? Case closed. I don't care that Haggerty did not accept this document. I don't because there wasn't a lawyer present. But to me, that is case closed. Clay Bertrand and Clay Shaw are the same person. And, um, you know, we can get into witness testimony from people like Dean Andrews and all sorts of other people. Uh, some of the people who knew him uh, from the gay community who, who, who uh, knew him as Clay Bertrand or Clem Bertrand. Uh, but let's keep going, okay? So this document by Aloysius Habergas is his signed document stating that, yeah, look, uh, I, here's, he did sign that and he did say this and, uh, you know, and his reply to me when I asked him what was his alias is Clay Bertram and he signs it. Yet this proof was not accepted during the trial. Okay, now the importance of that obviously is that Clay Bertrand, right, is the person who called Dean Andrews, the lawyer who had represented Oswald at least three times. He had met him between three and five times. And on the day after the assassination, Dean Andrews was sick in a hospital and he gets a phone call from Clay or Clem Bertrand saying, we need you to go up to Dallas to represent Oswald. Okay, so this, this is so important. And Dean Andrews tried to deny that he knew who Clem Bertrand was, but he got caught for perjury. And, uh, you know, it became obvious that he knew it was Clay Shaw and uh, Garrison knew that Dean Andrews was lying. They knew one another uh, from, you know, their earlier days. Now, if we want to add to this, uh, this here's an affidavit signed in front of a notary, okay, by a Mrs. Jesse Parker. And this is also in the garrison files. So what she does is, I'll go to the key point, is she worked in an airport and there was a lounge and people who could get into the lounge had to sign in. And she told, she in, you know, she, Judge Haggerty, she identified witness S1 or picture S1, that was Clay Shaw. And she says, I have examined the registration book and I recognize the signature of Clay Bertrand as the one which the gentleman I have identified placed in the book. Pretty strong evidence there, right? So, let me tell you what else I found. This is, I think, done for the first time. Okay, so this has been a, this is the first time analysis uh, that I'm going to discuss with you, as far as I know, anyway. In the garrison files, I was finding all sorts of documents that Clay Shaw signed either as a business person because he had properties, or um, as the manager of the ITM, the International Trademark. Those are signatures. You can see them. Clay Shaw. Clay Laverne Shaw. I think he has a Clay L Shaw. But what I found, okay, and I found this, all of a sudden I come upon a library card, the actual library card signed by Clem Bertrand. Okay, so it's a library card signed twice by Clem Bertrand. And it's made out to Clem Bertrand, if you can see that, of the international trademark. But there's no Clem Bertrand that works at the International Trademark. This is interesting on its own. Um, the garrison team at first mishandled this element. They said, oh, well, let's discount it because when they tried, you see the two phone numbers there, they didn't need any way the phone number. So they said, well, this is a phony piece of documentation. But let me show you what they wrote a little later. It's called the Bertrand, this is a garrison report. I will be recalled that some time ago, library employees, while going through their records, 
came across a library card made out to Clem or Clay Bertrand of the International Trademark. We discounted this lead as being negative because the phone number turned out to have no meaning. Okay, well, they say maybe we should take a look at it again. The signature appears to be in Cha's handwriting. They found that it looked similar. Okay, I asked myself, was this ever, ever compared? Well, I lucked out because in the past I've tried, you know, like uh, I think Tony or, or Neil, you were mentioning my article on Oswald's last letter to the Soviet embassy. And clearly that letter is a fake. And the Russians thought it was a fake because it was just too suspicious. I can get into that. It's a whole other article. And I tried to find a document expert. I even reached out to the person who used forensic document analysis to uh, find the Unabomber. Okay, and that, that person is a researcher who did research for the FBI in California, and he politely declined. Well, in this case, I said, God, I wish I could find a good handwriting expert. And I did. The person I found was a Miss Graziella Penditanetti. She has quite the credentials. I didn't put them on, okay? But she, she certified three times, and she's often been a witness in the Quebec Superior Court on document signatures and so on and so forth. I asked her, could you compare these signatures? So I isolated the signatures of Clem Bertrand and Clay Shaw, and I sent them to her. And this is just recent, by the way. You're getting a nice scoop because I talked to Len about it, but he didn't see these documents. So I sent it to her and over about five or six days, she got back to me. And this is what she reported. You'll see that it's very measured. She says, I have reviewed the signatures you sent me. I must first tell you that these signatures are not of good quality. They are copies of copies of copies. Ideally, I should examine originals or first generation copies made from the original. Despite everything, I can tell you that there are several similarities between these signatures on several levels. Movement, tilt, proportions, spacing, continuity, graphic level. This makes it possible to retain the hypothesis subject to that they were executed by the same hand. I am surprised to see the use of French names La Vergne in French and Bertrand, which is Bertrand, in the signatures, sincerely. Now, it's hardly a slam dunk on its own, but if you put it, you know, in with everything else we find, we, we're getting continuity here. You know, so this could be done. What would be really helpful is if we found more, better uh, uh, documents, more original ones, and perhaps more signatures of Clem Bertrand, because I think he signed the registry Clem Bertrand at that lounge. I may, it, I, it may be in those files, okay? And I may have missed it. But uh, if we found stuff that was a little bit more first generation, and if we found another or two or three other handwriting experts that would look at it and see how they compare. They're, they're, you know, if we got two or three opinions, that would be uh, fantastic. But I think I've gone as far as I'm gonna go on this piece. Um, for now. So that's going to be the first part of my next article, uh, part of it, on further proof that Clem Bertrand and Clay Shaw are the same persons. Um, uh, do you want me to go on to the next uh, item, or would you like us to take a moment to discuss now, or, or, or how do you feel? I, I, I'm okay one way or the other. I, I could go through all there, three and then there, open it up, or we could just discuss this. Are there any questions, anybody at this point? Uh, okay, I didn't open it to, uh, let me see. Uh, are we good to go? I'm not seeing every face, that's why. Uh, oh, Gary, you have a question? You're on mute. What does she mean by 
surprised to see the use of French names. Is she talking about the, the spelling? No, no, just the fact that, well, obviously New Orleans, right, was a French, French colony way back. So there are a lot of French names in New Orleans. So to, I guess it just surprised her that in an American state that you would see uh, French names uh, because there's, there are not that many Francophones in the US. I think that's what she meant. But it, it is interesting though that, you know, his, he would have used, um, you know, he has Lavergne as his middle name. And I looked into Clayshaw's history and I think there is some French there uh, and Bertrand. So that's what she, I didn't question her on Gary. So I don't know why she finds it uh, particularly interesting. I find it interesting that she finds it interesting. <laughs> but, can, I ask, um, can I ask a question? Is Laverne his mother's maiden name, possibly? Maybe. Maybe. I, I, you know what? You would find that there's a huge, a nice, nice profile of Clay Shaw in the Garrison Files. And I'd have to reread it. And I remember they went into his ancestry and all that. But, and there was, uh, you know, there, there, because that, you know, you're going back now a many years when you talk about Clay Bertrand in 1962 or Clay Shaw and you do ancestry as of that date. Uh, you know, I don't know how, they, 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 they didn't find it very thorough what they could find, but they found really interesting stuff. They go through his war record. They go through, uh, you know, uh, how he got out of the action in the war. You know, he, he got a cushy job, in other words, and how he got into intelligence, in a way, during World War II. So it's a very interesting background. And it, shouldn't be, that, it shouldn't be impossible to find out whether the no. name Laverne is in his family, because you can trace ancestry records through marriage registries, and birth mm -hmm. registries and things, the way people doing um, family history could do. I agree. Uh, I think a lot of the French in New Orleans, Louisiana, came out of Nova Scotia. Yeah. Well, you know, it's called, um, you know, when you hear the word Cajun, Cajun yes. food. Acadian. That's actually, that's actually a, a contraction of the word Acadian. Okay, so Acadian became Cajun. And uh, Acadian, yeah, you're right, because you have Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, which is very Francophone. Okay, it's about 40% Francophone. Quebec is 80% Francophone. And they did work their way down the Mississippi, the first, uh, the first explorers, and they made it down to uh, Nouvelle Orléans. New Orleans is Nouvelle Orléans. And uh, La Louisiane, it wasn't Louisiana. Uh, so there's an awful lot of French there, yeah. And you know, if you recall, Garrison's uh, one of his big jobs was 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 getting the corruption out of the French quarters of uh, New Orleans, right? That's why they have a very important French quarters in New Orleans. So, do you want Paul, me? Paul, can go I just uh, sure, Paul? Sure. It's Neil. Can I just can I just ask a question? Um, have you found any evidence at all that Clay Bertrand might have been somebody else? Sorry, no. No, no, I, I'm 99.9% uh, that Clay Bertrand is Clay Shaw. Okay. It's just, uh, I mean, I don't know how much um, <laughs> emphasis to put on this, but uh, some years back, I think it was a Rob Clark show. It might have been a Rob and Doug podcast. I think there was a suggestion that Dean Andrews um, had said that Eugene uh, Davis was Clay Bertrand. Um, he was the guy that was the manager of the the, the restaurant bar, the Court of mm. the Two Sisters. Court of the Two Sisters. Have you come across Court of Two Sisters? Yeah. Have you come across that suggestion at all? There's not even a sniff of that in the Garrison Files or anything else I've seen. But uh, uh, what's his name? Dean Andrews was so scared to be linked to Clay Shaw. He, he was afraid for his life and he, the, you couldn't pry it out of him who he was. He just did not want to admit it. And um, 
you know, if you look at who Dean Andrews does know, he knew Dean, he admits having known David Ferry very well. He admits having known, I think, Arcotra Smith. And so, you know, the people he, he does know is in the same network as Clay Shaw, you know, so, but that's my, uh, oh, no, there's no doubt to me that Clay Bertrand, I mean, look, this, just his alias that he put on that document to me is, uh, and if you get into, you know, the best book to read about that, in my opinion, is, it is still Destiny Betrayed. Destiny Betrayed by Jim DiEugenio. Uh, he really outlays the proof that there are the two and the same people. But this is just out, added documentation to, to what's well, not even added. The, Jim did talk about that document that he, 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 you know, I mean, that Haggerty did not accept that as an element of proof during the trial is amazing. Because there was no okay, lawyer present. Thank you. So shall I go on? Are you? Uh, and we can maybe pick up stuff later if you want. Okay, good. Thank you. Let me get this back to. Oh. Okay. So. Okay, now, if you've seen the JFK movie, uh, probably all of you have, you'll certainly remember that riveting scene after, you know, the, all the introduction around the history of Eisenhower, the, you know, Vietnam, um, and all the background information is given at the beginning of the movie. And then we open up with the scene of Rose Shermy being thrown out of a car. And what was amazing, I, I'm gonna go on memory on this story, but basically uh, she was thrown out of a car. She was brought to the hospital. Um, she met Francis Fuge for a first time, who is a Louisiana state police officer. And she predicted the murder, but she was in a, uh, you know, she was under the influence. While at the hospital, she was predicting the murder to healthcare workers, even up to a few minutes before the assassination. She was saying things along the lines, here's when it's going to happen. And then when it did happen, that went viral in the hospital and all the health workers were saying, my God, we have a patient who's been predicting this for a number of times, uh, uh, quite a number of times, and it happened. They were so uh, adamant about it that uh, I don't know who they call, but Francis Fuge ended up coming back. And she was in withdrawal from uh, her, her, her drug dependency. And she, she talked, and, and while she talked, she said that she had worked for Jack Ruby. Now, for some reason, I always focused on the how did someone foretell? That's always been my focus on that. that. That's amazing that she foretold it. And I didn't spend as much attention on that other key element that she had worked for Jack Ruby. Okay, and she said that Jack Ruby and Oswald were bed partners. Um, so that to me just sounded a little bit like embellishment or, you know, I, I wasn't sure how to take it. Uh, you know, by then she, she could have known about Jack Ruby and Oswald in the news. So how credible was that part? So anyway, let, that brings me to the next document. Okay, and it's one signed by Francis Fuge. Francis Fuge later became an investigator for Garrison. But unfortunately, by the time that investigation got underway, uh, she had died mysteriously. Uh, she, she, she was on the side of the road, she was run over by a car. Uh, so she could no longer be a witness to what had happened. But Francis Fuge had checked into her story because she said that she was in a car with two Latinos and <clears throat> they went to, uh, uh, I think, uh, a bar 
called the Silver Slipper. She, that's where the fight started. And, uh, you know, and then she was saying they were going to pick up some drugs. I think it was, you know, in, uh, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere. I'm not sure if it was Galveston or not. But anyway, uh, so he checked into that. And, and the boat that came in checked out. The stop at the Silver Slipper checked out. They even looked at pictures. I'm talking about the bar person or the bartender or the owner. I forget who. And they identified, and I'm going on memory here, but they identified some Latinos a person. And I think one of them was Sergio Arcacha Smith. However, I said, okay, well, this is, this is getting more and more. And I'd have to research this. I'm still researching that aspect there of, uh, of who was identified by the, and when that was, took place. But this document got my attention, okay? And if you read it, right, it's uh, Francis Fuge of the Louisiana State Police, and here's what he writes. We wish to further state that fingerprint identification shows that deceased subject Melba Christine Marcades is the same person as subject Rose Sheremy, who was in custody for us, and he gives the dates, and then she, he says, at which time she stated that she once worked for Jack Ruby as a stripper. And these are the words that got my attention, which was verified. Okay, so you have a Louisiana state police who has which was verified. Okay, and then she talked about them being bed partners and that she said that Ruby had an alias called Pinky. Uh, and then, you know, uh, so other statements made by subject relative to your inquiry are hearsay, but are available upon your request. Anyway, uh, what date was this signed? I, you see, I, yeah, April 4th, 1967. Okay, so that's a key date. Which was verified. Now, try and wrap your brain around that. The person who foretold of the assassination and who got everybody's attention, including Fruge, including the health caregivers, was a stripper for the person who assassinated Oswald. The link with Arcacha Smith in New Orleans, right, is, uh, is less uh, substantive for now. But if you also have that link, I mean, this is getting just to be too much now, right? So, uh, I, I'm putting it up there, but I would say that this is a supremely important point. It probably means that she was doing drug running for Jack Ruby, that she knew maybe from Jack Ruby of what was going to happen with the assassination, that probably there's a network between Jack Ruby and some of these Cuban exiles. I mean, that's what it would seem to suggest. Now, this next piece I'm gonna show you, I decided I would go the stripper route for you because there's another piece here. And I have to admit this one is based on one witness. Okay, and I'll talk to you about, so you've all heard the name Jada. Jada was a stripper that Jack Ruby recruited in New Orleans. Now, when you went down to New Orleans to recruit and in that business, apparently, it had to involve the network of Carlos Marcelo. Okay, so you know when you're in that line of business, uh, it was mafia related, and I don't have any proof of that. But uh, he recruits Shada to come and be his star performer at the Carousel Club. So she was the lead, the lead performer, and if you see her pictures, you can see she's pretty exotic. Um, so Detective Frank Malush writes a report who worked for a garrison, March 11, 1967. So in this report, he gets a telephone call from a, someone called Charles Nernick, Burns, Burns from St. Louis. And look, it's a bit long, but here's what he says. He says uh, that he was in Dallas 
on the day of the uh, assassination and he was going to see the motorcade or he was on the motorcade route. And as he was crossing 11th Avenue, I stepped out in the street and I was hit by this gal in a Cadillac license number, Louisiana license number 941985. And her name was Jeanette Conforto, also known as Jada. She was in Dallas on that day. She was employed by the Carousel Club Jack Ruby. She made the statement, okay, to company security people since they were on the accident job and they questioned her, okay, they asked her if she could, they could get a hold of her on the job at the Carousel Club and she said no, the nightclub would not be open that night. Now, the thing is here is if I can read on is that accident happened 30 minutes or 40 minutes before the assassination. So this would suggest that Jack Ruby was already telling his employees or some of them or one of them or number, don't come in tonight. And it's a Friday night. That's not a calm night, you know, for, for that type of, uh, for that type of business. And well, I'll let you read the, the rest of it. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I found that to be quite interesting. Now, it hasn't been corroborated. And I've actually heard from Greg Parker and a few other people saying, you know what? I heard that this, this thing, that she actually left uh, the day Oswald was assassinated. Why is my battery running low? Give me a second. <sighs> Charging, I'm sorry. Okay, it's charging, great. Sorry, I had a little uh, little snaffle there. So um, I found this document, these two documents stood out for me when I read them. Okay, well, you know what? I'll cover the next topic too. Um, Next, well, no, no, let's take a break because I have a third topic I'll cover in the article. And I just will open it again to see if you have any questions about that. Again, keep in mind that I, I'm really just showing you documents that got my attention. And I, you know, uh, I, I haven't pushed the research that much beyond what I've been seeing there, but um, I, I'm all ears now if you have any questions or any comments. Um, just to jump in, there is a comment from Scott, uh, Scott Reed. Scott, do you want to jump in? You put an interesting comment in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Tony. It was really just to add that uh, a friend of mine uh, did quite a bit of research on Jada, and uh, she covers that incident about Jada leaving, you know, trying to get out of Dallas just before the assassination. And her article was in the... I think there's a, just a new edition of Garrison who's just been released, the magazine, but it's in the previous edition, so maybe about six months ago. And uh, she gets into gets into this uh, story in quite some detail and just generally, you know, a bit, a bit of background about Dad and who she was and, you know, who she mixed with, etc. Oh, yeah, that, that, that you know, I, I would love to see more research in Jada. I would love to, and some of the other strippers. I mean, Tammy True and Nancy Rich, and <laughs> so. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, and again, I don't want to, you know, claim that what I'm showing you is more than what it is. It, but it's an interesting uh, witness, and it, it certainly deserves more scrutiny, in my opinion. Uh, the Rose Jeremy element, where I see, you see that uh, Francis Fuchs says this was verified that she worked as a stripper, to me is very significant. I, I have, a, you can tell that the people who wrote about Francis Fuge have a high opinion of her. Are there any more could, comments here or do yeah, I? Could, could I ask, could I ask you, Paul? Yeah. The, the allusion in the Rose Sheremy uh, document about uh, Oswald and Ruby being bed partners, uh, do, we, do we take that to, to allude to the fact that they were in a relationship then according to, to her. It's sure. not a euphemism for something else, is it? No, 
it, 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 look, there's a, if, when you read the garrison files, there's an element that is mind boggling. And it's the sightings of a Leon Oswald, who's a bit sloppy, who's got a bit of a beard, but that everybody identifies as Lee Harvey Oswald. And this Leon is often with gay Mexicanos or gay Cubans, and, and there's all sorts of rumors of him being gay. And, uh, and then you have, uh, you have the Lee Oswald, who's the patsy. Now, I'm not saying that's the impression you get. You say, geez, there seems to be two personalities there. Okay, there seems to be two personalities, and I'm agnostic as to how much of um, an imposter uh, is involved and not. It's so complex, that part. But when you read the garrison files, that is an extremely confusing area. The gay Oswald versus the Oswald. That, because there are so many scenes of Oswald in, you know, the court of the two sisters, for instance, with a gay crowd. Okay, there's so many stories of that. And what adds depth, I'm going to talk about uh, eventually, I'm convinced that Oswald had a Cuban escort assigned to him based on these files. There's too many, uh, I'm going to write about uh, too many sightings him with a very stocky Cuban, five foot six, uh, who's got an athletic build. And this person is described by Sylvia Audio, by Roger Craig, by uh, Richard Case Nagel, at least 11, 12 witnesses. And no, actually, I'm up to about 25 people who described this sighting of Oswald. And, and it's, it's difficult to figure out what's going on there. So that's the best I can tell you on that. I, I don't know. Uh, Paul, uh, is there any proof that Jack Ruby was homosexual? There's a lot of allegation to that effect. Of course, you know, he wasn't, uh, he, he never had, we never hear of any uh, uh, spouse at any time. Um, apparently, they, you know, some people say he liked having oral sex with the women while he was, you know, uh, uh, with a guy, you know. Uh, the, he, he had a, uh, so many of the strippers say that he was gay. Uh, Many, but, and it seems to be a recurring thing. I'll tell you, it seems to be a recurring thing. You hear it a lot. You go and see the Ruby uh, file in Garrison and other documents, and there's a lot of witness testimony to that effect. I, I know at the time of the assassination, he was uh, sharing an apartment uh, with a man called George Senator. Yes, Senator, think, that's right. Yes, and I think there was speculation about that. Senator, I'll tell you, was had a family though. Right? He he had broken off with someone, so I, it doesn't mean anything really. But I mean, uh, he, 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 yeah. Uh, so Senator was questioned, and Senator claims that he didn't see any evidence of Oswald being gay. But you know, uh, if you had to ask my my opinion, is probably that he he, he had uh, hom uh, homosexual relations relationships but i wouldn't bet the farm on it i have heard if i recall that he uh, essentially regarded his dog sheba as oh, yeah. or as the nearest thing to one wasn't that a sausage dog i can't <laughs> <I'm> recall just... <laughs> i know no it wasn't i think it was a, a poodle or a yeah. or something oh yeah like i think so yeah Okay, uh, so yeah, no, it's very interesting. And when you get into that, oh boy, you, you know, you, uh, you, really, uh, you really get into uh, areas where, you, you know, you have to end up saying, I'm not sure. Yeah, fascinating documents, Paul. Well, I'm going to go to another couple that you're going to really like, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so one of the articles I'm really, uh, was really excited about, uh, is my the last two I wrote for Kennedy's King and King about exposing the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Um, I think those two articles play a pretty important role in demonstrating that that was a front. 
Okay, and the reason the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, I, I go into all the reasons, but uh, I mean, I can give you many. First of all, it just didn't make sense that Oswald would choose New Orleans, which is the most hostile city in the United States for such an endeavor, okay, because they were so reliant on North-South trade. Uh, you know, you couldn't find a worse place other than perhaps Miami to open up a FPCC chapter. He did it when the FPCC chapter was in its death spiral. I mean, it had only, they normally would have 25 meetings a year nationally. They were down to three that year. Uh, it was just, you know, after the Bay of Missiles crisis, uh, sorry, the uh, missile crisis, it, it just wasn't fashionable to be part of the Fair Play for Cuba committee. So he goes and joins it and he does all the things an awful lot of other informants do when they're part of the FPCC. And uh, so I did a couple of articles on that. And I found a couple of things in the garrison files that uh, say, you know what, I'm gonna write about the garrison files, but I'm gonna have a little section on part three of the FPCC. And I'm gonna show you two new documents that I'm gonna focus on, okay? So um, you can still see the screen. This here, okay, the Dallas Morning News, June 10th, 1979, they wrote an article, and I'll bring you to the key part of the article. You know how problematic 544 Camp Street became for anybody who's a lone apologist. I mean, it's just too crazy. How could Oswald be at that location, you know, where he's in the heart of red, red you know, uh, uh, right wing activity, where there are Cuban exiles, where there's Guy Bannister who's known for rooting out communists. Okay, so the answer is, is he was working for a Guy Bannister, you know, as someone who used that position for two reasons uh, to get people to sign up for the Fair Play for Cuba committee so that they could have files on potential communists. And the other reason you would do that is to have the credentials to eventually go into Cuba. Those are the two reasons. Uh, informants were part of the Fair Play, Fair Play for Cuba committee. Now, this, I, you know, so you had the Gerald Posner's come out and say, well, you know, 544 Camp Street isn't that close to Bannister's office. They keep trying to put walls and floor space between it. Of course, they're not going to share the same conference room. I mean, they're, they're going to try and keep a little bit of distance here. Now, this article, let's go to page two of it. This is what it states, okay? The news recently interviewed a secretary who worked at the New Orleans address in 1963. They're talking about 544 cancer. Mrs. Delphine Roberts was employed by former Chicago FBI chief W. Guy Bannister. She said when he helped locate space for Oswald as an undercover agent in an office above Bannister's at 544 Camp Street. I mean, Bannister helped find him that space. And this uh, Delphine uh, Roberts wasn't just a secretary, she became Bannister's mistress. Let's go to another document. This one, I'm analyzing it and it's not when fully analyzed, but this was an information sheet, okay? Made by the Crusade for Free Cuba, which was closely related to the CRC, uh, CRF or Cuban Revolutionary Front or Council, CRC, yeah. Now, look at this. We finally have a pretty big list of names here of people, right? And in there, Look at some of the interesting names. One of them is Robert D. Riley. I'm now 70% sure that he's linked to the Riley Coffee Company, where Oswald worked at some. Ernesto Rodriguez, father and son. Okay, well, son is the one, remember, that 
operated that language school that Oswald first went to uh, to talk to him. He wanted to take Spanish courses and eventually uh, Rodriguez said uh, to him, based on another question he had, you want to re meet Carlos Bringier. And that led to the Carlos Bringier meeting, which led to the eventual fight between Carlos Bringier and um, Oswald on, um, you know, in front of the international trademark, I think. Now let's keep going. So these names need to be analyzed because those are the two that stand out from this part of the list, but let's keep going. Do you see where their address is, right? Cuban Revolutionary Council headquarters, 544 Camp Street, room six. Sergio Arcacha Smith is linked to that address. We all knew that he moved out at one point. Okay, let's keep looking. The youth, person in charge of youth and often seen at that address, Carlos Quiroga. Now remember that name, okay? So you're seeing names here, right? Manuel Gill, right? Manuel Gill is the lawyer uh, that's also in the same building uh, and is a lawyer that worked with David Ferry. The reason I find this document so interesting has to do with the characters. And then are you, you're gonna tell me it's coincidence that um, Oswald bumps into um, Carlos Quiroga, bumps into Ernesto Rodriguez, uh, you know, is so close in proximity, you know, works for Riley Coffee Company. Uh, okay. Let's start off with that. Now, Carlos Quiroga. I'm going to open this up. We're going to stop for now, and we'll have a little uh, discussion about Carlos Quiroga. Anybody know the Carlos Quiroga story? No? Okay, Carlos Quiroga, this is so important, and it's document. He went to Oswald's apartment, okay? Uh, I think it was shortly before the fight. He had a stack, three to four inches, if not more sorry, three to five inches, a fair play for Cuba flyers. He was seen by witnesses. He admitted going there. And his excuse when he talked to Garrison was, oh, I was pretending to infiltrate the FPCC so I could spy on them. But he was doing no such thing. That stack of papers that he brought with him was very telling. It wasn't one sheet. It was a stack. And that was seen by at least one witness. And, um, uh, and the thing is, is it, it's more likely that he was supplying him and conniving with Oswald, that they were actually working in a team and that this whole fight would be a setup. Now, I have a lot of evidence uh, around that. But one thing Garrison would do is he would polygraph the people that he'd interview. And he interviewed Quiroga and he gave him a polygraph. And let's look at the polygraph. I knew that, that, that he had been polygraphed, okay? And you can see the name Quiroga. Now, look, this is the second page is I want to get your attention on this, okay? So let me... Okay. Oh gosh, you know what? Just give me a second, gentlemen. I will go and get this document because it's worth it. Okay, so um, I, I, yeah, I'm gonna go and get this document because I, I put down the wrong page, I think. So give me a second, I'll be back with you in no time.
I apologize for this, but uh, it, it, I think it's really worth, uh, really worth seeing. Key files, garrison, lead file. Oh, geez, I had it there. Yes, okay, I have it now. Now this is really important, so I, I apologize for that little delay, but let me go get that. Uh, e yeah. Okay. Gary, can you see that document where it's marked question two, three, four? Good, okay. So look, this is what the polygraph said. After careful analysis of this subject's second polygram, it is the opinion of the examiner that we have specific reactions indicative of deception to the relative questions under examination. In the late summer of, in the summer of 1963, did you see Lee Oswald with any Latin descent subject? Answer, no, he lied. Isn't it a fact that you knew that the Fair Play for Cuba activities were a, merely a cover? Answer, no, a lie. Was Oswald in reality part of an anti-Castro operation? No, again, a lie. According to your knowledge, did David Ferry know Arcacha Smith? He says, no, that's proven that he, okay? So then according to your information or your own knowledge, did David Ferry know Guy Bannister? No. The key one here is I didn't know this question was asked. Okay. Um, let me go back to share. Okay, so you know what? Um, I have a chart on the prior plots. It doesn't have to do with the uh, files, but those are uh, examples of samples that I found very interesting. And the Koroga story is really, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but another witness that Garrison uh, polygraphed uh, stated that he had seen Koroga with Oswald, not just one time, a number of times. And Koroga, so you you understand his importance. He was uh, one of the top three in the. Uh, he was part of the DRE. He knew Carlos Bringier. He knew Sergio Arcacha Smith. He knew Guy Bannister. Okay. He knew David Ferry. So this person is a, a very interesting lead. Who uh, I think uh, through the polygram, I mean you know polygraphs are not perfect, but if you consider that he was polygrammed and found to be lying, and the person who was polygrammed who said that he had seen Quiroga with Oswald a number of times was found to be saying the truth, you've got some pretty compelling evidence there. And throwing Delphine Roberts, uh, I mean, to me, if she, when you think that the Dallas Morning News interviewed her, and she said, oh, yeah, no, Bannister helped her him find <laughs> the space in 544 Camp Street, which makes sense when you think of it. 
because Oswald had babysitters in New Orleans, and one of them for sure was Guy Bannister, who was giving him directions. So that I, I think, uh, uh, I hope, I mean, these are just some of the pages. There are others. There are other pages in there. Uh, I'll tell you, I the research that I've done, I'll tell you how it's influenced me. I am now convinced that Clay Shaw, we know now that he was a well-paid uh, uh, intelligence asset that's been confirmed. Joan Mellon got that from Freedom Access to Information. It's been confirmed. Well, I'll go even further. It's my opinion that he was connected to Alan Dulles. Okay, I, it's my opinion, and I, I will write about that in a future article. Uh, it's my opinion that Oswald, because of these files, had an escort that was assigned to him. And that escort that you often see validates so many testimonies about Oswald, including Silviati, including Richard Castengel, including Roger Craig, because you can almost see that, that, that uh, Cuban escort as a tattoo. He's so distinctive in his look that for him to say, oh yeah, no, he was with such a person. Every time you say he was with such a person, a Latino, he was short and he had a thick neck. And he was had a, a very stocky. And you hear that precise description so often come back that validates so many testimonies. That's going to be an important article too I'm going to write about is Oswald's escort. And I'm going to show all the pieces of where people identify this escort. Uh, I think the international trademark played a role in some ways similar to Permindex. Okay, you're maybe familiar with the Permindex story, uh, you know, in, um, in uh, Europe, how Clay Shaw was connected with Permindex and how Permindex was used to fund right-wing activities, including attempted uh, assassination attempts of the goal and rigged elections in Italy. Italy. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are certain things now that I know, there are certain things that I think strongly but that's what the garrison files have done for me. And I do have one other, uh, I'll, I'll just show you another slide that if some of you want to go to discuss later, because you know, I talked about the prior plots. Uh, I think Neil and Bart thought I would talk more about what I discussed on the, in the documentary. Um, I'll just show you an important chart that we can maybe discuss later. Um, is this it? Lead file, key files, yeah. You see, this was a chart that I put up on Kennedy's and King, and it's all the people that I think may have been potential patsies uh, that have very similar, uh, similar, sim that many similarities. It just can't be happenstance. Uh, but I think before we, if we decide to discuss that, if we have enough time, I think we can maybe stick to the the original one. So maybe on that note. Uh, I don't know who's, Tony, are you uh, presiding the meeting or no, it's Neil or if he, I don't, I, I'm leaving it open to you on what you would like to do next. <laughs> it's, very, oh, yeah. it's, very, it's, very flex, it's very flexible, Paul. Now that was, that's really, that's really interesting. Can, can we open it up to the floor for some questions? For sure. For yeah, sure. I have a question. Who, who's talking, Matthew? Okay, hi, Matthew. Matthew, hi. Yeah, hi, Paul. Thanks for your thanks for the talk. Um, could you tell us a bit more about Dean Andrews? I've always found him a quite a fascinating character. And why do you think such a strange individual would have been chosen to represent Oswald, uh, to represent um, Clay Shaw? Yeah, that's a very good question. Why him? Well, first of all, if you go into Clay Shaw's nightlife and his little, uh, his little personal lives, it's a very seedy, very, and I'm not, there's no homophobia in this, by the way. I mean, that's what they're accusing Garrison of. But it is a really, really peculiar uh, network. I mean, you have David Ferry in there, who's, excuse me, very weird. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you have, uh, and in a way, 
uh, the, I, the CIA, apparently, if you read Fletcher Prouty's work, had cleared lawyers, okay, lawyers to handle certain things. And Dean Andrews handled a lot of cases that had to do with, uh, you know, with uh, artists and, and Latinos in New Orleans, including a lot of gay uh, Latinos, which was illegal at the time. Anything they get into, you know, they get into uh, trouble. So when Oswald was first went in to meet Dean Andrews, he was accompanied with four or five gay Latinos. Okay, and they all seem to be hobnobbing. So it seems to be a choice. He seems to have had a relationship with Clay Shaw to take care of tricky business along those lines. Now, uh, he's also someone who didn't keep, you know, like, I, I think for that role, that particular role, he seems to have been a talented lawyer. Okay, and, and, and he had certain specialties that he took care of. A and it, but it's very hard to know because there's, it's been kept so secret that Clay Shaw, in fact, hired him. But Dean Andrews, uh, he, he, he seemed to be able also to play it, you know, dirty, hide files, uh, be secretive. Uh, so, you know, and maybe when he started up with uh, Clay Shaw, uh, you know, there wasn't really an eye on the assassination in the first you know, uses of Dean Andrews. So, uh, so I, I can't tell you more than that. I, I mean, uh, he, I, I, I've also wondered why him, but in a way, the fact that he was himself exotic and he was in that neck of the woods and he knew David Ferry, he worked even on certain doses concerning Carlos Marcelo. Okay, and he did know Manuel Gill who worked on uh, uh, doses with Carlos Marcelo. So he seemed to be part of a gang that were like thinking. Uh, that's the best I can tell you about, about Dean, but he's a very interesting character. And he, he seems to be someone who would have played ball on any level, like he relished the idea of representing uh, Oswald. The first reason that Oswald dealt with Dean Andrews was to rectify his dishonorable discharge. That was the first uh, mandate that Dean Andrews had for Oswald, because probably had to do with his pension. I don't know, but uh, Oswald was very adamant about changing that. Um, he also gave him advice after the fight on Canal Street. He didn't officially represent him, but he gave him advice. He revealed that, Clay, that Oswald told him, told Dean Andrews, that the distribution of fair play for Cuba committee flyers wasn't a real, uh, it, was, uh, it was a job and he was being paid $20 a day. That's what I can tell you about uh, Dean Andrews. Uh, you know, so if you look at his organization, his secretary, the guy who did research for him is a guy called Prentice Davies. It's all sort of, you know, it's not like a high level legal firm. So it probably had a role they could do that, you know, uh, fit well with their, uh, with their uh, profile. Uh, but beyond that, I can't tell you more. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Could I ask another question, if that's okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that the Garrison files will focus more on, uh, you know, obviously New Orleans, but I wondered when he was looking into the, you know, the kind of fair play for Cuba committee leaflets and things, whether he came across anything that said that Oswald did something similar in Dallas uh, in April 63. I've read some information that Oswald did a similar stunt, if you like, uh, in Dallas, around about the time of the water shooting? Yeah, yeah, he, um, yeah, that's a very uh, good question, uh, Scott. Uh, I actually write about it in the other article about the uh, exposing the Fair Play for Cuba committee. Oswald most likely, uh, he, he started his relationship with the Fair Play for Cuba committee while he was in Dallas before going down to New Orleans. And Garrison has stuff in his files including an arrest 
in New Orleans, but while he was living in Dallas, where he was on the lakefront with a guy called Ceso Hernandez, who's a character, same name as a Hernandez that shows up in that courtroom and the fight on Canal Street. But he's never been, the Cecil and his, his, his identity has never been confirmed for sure as a person who was arrested with Oswald. Um, when they arrested Oswald, uh, he, he also wrote to the Fair Play for Cuba committee saying, hey, in Dallas, I you know, had a placard and I was distributing files, uh, the, the flyers, I would need some more of them. Okay, so there is an awful lot to what you're saying. Uh, and it's so important, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I, I have a document, and I didn't talk about it today, but it would seem that the first, uh, the first correspondence he had with Vincent T. Lee, who was at the national headquarters of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, is a letter that can be demonstrated to be uh, one that wasn't written by Oswald alone. It was typed, I think. I'm, I'm saying this night down. There were not enough spelling errors in it. it. It just, some people have looked into it and they say he clearly was aided for that letter. Uh, just like I think he was with the, if he even wrote it for that last letter to the Cuban embassy. Uh, and by the way, that's something, if we could find uh, someone who does document, forensic document analysis, it would be great to analyze those letters and all, and all that. But uh, so Garrison, uh, his files were very, um, very heavy and very uh, concentrated. He has an awful lot on New Orleans, but he got into, even after the assassination, after his um, trial, he has quite a few files about Dallas. He has uh, files about what happened on Harlandale Street, if you recall, where Oswald was seen to uh, being going in. So you have a lot of information. He went, he didn't go to Miami too much, uh, but he has some stuff on Miami. Uh, but he was a bit more limited. Had he had the cooperation from the FBI or, uh, you know, real intelligence forces, he would have been formidable. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Scott, but uh, he does have stuff on the Dallas FPCC. So just out of interest, uh, just like a bit of a silly story. A few years ago, a friend and I, uh, we stood at the the point in uh, Camp Street where Oswald was handing out the flyers, and we were handing out flyers uh, for a play that a friend was in. So it was quite interesting standing there handing out the flyers. I wonder if that's the first time that had been done in 50 years. We didn't get arrested, fortunately. Should have got a stocky Cuban, a Cuban escort helping you. Yeah. <laughs> That's the why they're speculating. It may have been a bit dangerous doing what he was doing, so they thought he might need a bodyguard, is what I've read. Thanks, Paul. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I could, if you want, well, send um, you... Yes? Sorry, carry on. Oh no! I, 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 I look. I you're going to have an article within three or four weeks on uh, Kennedy's and King with those documents in them. So, uh, and if you want to see the last one I, I I put up, I suggest you read the prior plots article, and you'll see one of the last pages, especially part two. You'll see this uh, that document I showed of comparable patsies and potential patsies, and because of the Garrison files, I think I'm going to add another person. I'm going to add another potential patsy. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's actually adding uh, more evidence to many of the articles I've ever also written. Uh, he has examples of uh, insiders who've uh, admitted, insiders, investigation insiders who've admitted, you know, that the uh, stuff like along the lines that there's a conspiracy. So there's, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But, you know, I, I'll tell you, I got so confused with the people like, you know, Chris, Chrisman or Chrisman, uh, Beckham, uh, Beckett, Beckham. I, you know, so I got into some names that were important names that Joan Mellon knows, and I couldn't figure that world out very well. That I was getting confused. Uh, odd churches, uh, 
all sorts of, I mean, you know, you, there are things that, that it, it's, it opens up so many rabbit holes and to start getting patterns and everything. That's why we have to, uh, you know, we have to crowdsource this because I'm certain if uh, people of your caliber and some of the people Len and I know in the U.S. were to go through these files, uh, we'd come up with a few nuggets. Matthew, do you have a question? Um, Paul, can I ask you a question? Paul, it's Paul. It's Neil again. I'm just. Can I just ask, ask a question on behalf of, of one of our participants, David? Um, he's interesting. Interested to know if you have discovered anything particularly significant in the Garrison files uh, with regard to the alleged Oswald trip to Mexico City in September. Oh, not as much. Not as much. Uh, there may be suggestions about who drove him down, but. Garrison suspect there is stuff though, but it, it, you know it, it's it's it would be so outdated compared to the Lopez report that I don't I didn't find it. But look, Garrison clearly suspected there was something. He, he was saying if we could figure out what happened there, okay, I'm sure we're going to find a lot of clues to the assassination. That's how far he had gone in his book, the trail of the, uh, on the trail of the assassins. And, you know, I, and again, I may have missed things. And, uh, you know, we're talking about 10,000 pages, but I didn't see, he doesn't have a file on Mexico city. I think he, but he alludes to it in other files. It, it okay, wasn't, you know, like there was so, yeah, sorry. I, I just want to complete it. I mean, there was so much that was classified around Mexico city that even he couldn't get his hands on. Mm -hmm. um, do you, have you come across anything with respect to Oak Cliff and the Tippett murder? He has files on that. He definitely has files on it, uh, but, oh boy, let me try and think of what was substantive there. There's something really interesting about Nancy Rich and Reynolds, okay, Reynolds, who took a shot, a bullet in his head, right? Uh, because yeah. he, he, uh, he claimed, forget what exactly what he witnessed, but it was something to the effect that Oswald didn't do it, you know, didn't kill Tippett. And uh, so he has an interesting stuff there for sure. And I think it's uh, Betty McDonald or anyone, one of the strippers who hung herself in the jail so there's some interesting um, stuff around Tippett, but I, I don't know if there's anything that goes beyond some of the books that were written about Tippett, which I have to admit is not an area for Tavon. It's not a big, I, I haven't read enough about the Tippett assassination. I know the broad lines, but, uh, but uh, he does have interesting thought. You may, I'm sure you'd find stuff in interesting, but not as much as that got my attention as the ones that I showed you there. Len, okay. you're on mute. Um, there's, another question. there's another question from the floor, floor again, Paul, um, regarding, um, and I know you mentioned it at the very beginning with respect to Len, how, how do we access these files? What, what, what do we do? Oh, well, why don't I let, Len, I think had a question and Len can give you that answer. Len, do you want to unmute yourself for that one or? Yeah, okay. Sure. I, I just made a link in the uh, chat. So I, I put it up on WeTransfer. So if you go to the chat, you just click on the link there, right? Do you guys see that? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, okay, Lando, is that what you were going to say when you yeah. raise your hand? Yeah. Okay. Well, I see Scott was asking, right? And I, the link is right there. I hope everybody can see it. Everybody see it? I actually I don't know what, but I can't see it. But it maybe I can't it. see it either. Yeah. Len, you see it? Yeah. You see it on the chat? I can see it in the chat. Oh, you can? Yeah. I can't. I can't see it. <laughs> so I need to know base. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that, Len? You restricted it. 
No, that's fine. <laughs> it's probably going to appear. It's probably going to appear. It takes a while to get in from Vancouver, I guess, right? Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Len, I think you sent it directly to me rather than to everyone. So uh, that's ah. why I'm, I'm just You're on mute, Len. Okay, right. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay, you're right. I didn't click Please everyone. That would explain it. Thanks, Len. Ben for you. Uh, another question for you, Paul. Sure. Um, regarding um, Jack Ruby, for such, for a character who's so entwined in the whole JFK story. It strikes me that we don't really know a lot about Jack Ruby. He's still a very enigmatic figure. Um, and a lot of his employees have been only cursorily uh, interviewed. I mean, I saw an interview on YouTube with Jada or Jada and she struck me, I don't want to be perjurative, but she struck me as quite an intelligent woman, not, not someone you would would Clark put it down if you had to make a choice as a stripper and um, I just find that um, Ruby is someone that's just been skated over um, what are your thoughts on that well I'll tell you what I find very interesting obviously when you look at Jack Ruby right um, you have to look at what he did during 48 hours right of stalking uh, the president. Then you have to look at his background as a, a, a mafia related figure who comes from Chicago, kind of linked to the, um, the uh, Capone network, comes down to New Orleans, okay? And then he gets into the Marcello network. I mean, when I say network, I can't tell you how close they're tied. The phone calls that are, he is doing and the analysis of phone calls that he's making to mafia related figures during the weeks up to the assassination, his first visitor in jail being Seville, uh, the, sorry, one of the top people in Dallas, the top mafioso in Dallas, basically probably telling him to, hey, keep your mouth shut. Uh, then I think the really interesting things for me is his trip to Cuba to try and spring uh, Traficante. That's a fact. Okay. And then the other thing that I find very interesting with Ruby is the whole McKeon uh, Ruby link. And when you get McKeon, uh, you know, that link there, it, it Jack, uh, Larry Hancock, and I think uh, John Armstrong cover it really well if you go on John Armstrong's website. And uh, when you consider that McKeon states that, yeah, Jack Ruby tried to use me to open doors to get uh, traffic anti out of Cuba, basically. Uh, and then he says, oh yeah, no, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, v. Harvey Oswald showed up with a Latino and tried to buy savage rifles from me, you know? so. Uh, that whole Ruby uh, link, I, I agree with you because when I read the files, there's cases to be made that Clay Shaw knew Jack Ruby. And was Oswald really in the carousel club with Jack Ruby, uh, you know? Um, I, think, well, I, think it was, I think it was Beverly Oliver that put him there, wasn't it? Well, there's Amongst others. others. And, yeah. You know, one of the sightings of him in there is with that stocky Cuban. Okay, so I said, where does that come out? The stocky Cuban again, uh, you know, with, uh, with Oswald in the carousel club. And that part there really has me wondering about uh, an Oswald imposter and Oswald, uh, you know, the Oswald who was the patsy. And I, I have trouble decoding that whole area. That, that's my next question, actually. How does the stocky Cuban minder fit in with the Oswald and fake Oswald story and, and even Sylvia Odio's, um, uh, is it Sylvia Odio? Oh, I got that wrong. Yeah. Is it Sylvia Odio? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, are, can we make a clear distinction between uh, an Oswald 
or a, an, a Leon Oswald, I think she said he, she, he was introduced as, with a minder and a Lee Harvey Oswald who's the real Oswald, or is it much more murky than that? It's difficult. That's all I can see. Is it's, I, I read it and I'm saying, God, God, because it, the, the two Oswald personalities I'm seeing, and I, I, I can't tell you whether they're the same or not, but you're hearing one where he has this stubby beard growth and he's a bit sloppy and he doesn't dress well and he's often uh, with Latinos and, and, uh, uh, and often seen in a gay crowd. Okay. And that's in pool halls and, and uh, uh, some of these CD bars. Uh, okay. And then you have the Oswald who's got a family. <laughs> you have a and he's tends to be well grown and he's not rich, but he tends to be neat. And it, it just and you know, some of these sightings with the stocky uh, Cuban with an Oswald, there's a couple while Oswald is in Russia. Okay, so I, I, I we know that people were using the Oswald name around the Cuban exile community to buy uh, vehicles, right? To uh, to, to uh, help the, uh, the, the, um, the Cuban exiles fight, uh, fight the, off uh, Castro, I'm sorry. So we know that Oswald was being impersonated even when he was in Russia. We know that Oswald was impersonated in Cuba. That's, and not in Cuba, in Mexico. That's clear that he was impersonated. I don't know if anybody disagrees with that, but there's so many witnesses who said that uh, when Oswald was interviewed after the assassination, that they had heard the tapes, the tapes had not been destroyed. We're talking about FBI people, and they were saying the voice on those tapes were not Oswald's. I think Jim DiEugenio has it up to nine or 10 people who've confirmed hearing the tapes and saying those were not, that was not Oswald's voice. I, so I think, the we, CIA, I, think, I think the CIA even admitted that, didn't they? They uh, was it a, or was it CIA or a report to um, um, Hoover, the FBI, Hoover, 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 Hoover saying, said it to, yeah, yeah. The, the voice is not the Oswalds. Yeah, you can hear that. You you can find that yeah. on YouTube. You can find that on the web. Hoover saying, and here's the problem: the voice on the tape is not the voice of Oswald. So that that is so so confusing. Is yeah. where is there a uh, you know like. There was a sighting of an Oswald in Washington, okay, right before a motorcade. And this guy was uh, really making himself known, but we, we, you know, and there was a rumor that Oswald was going to move to Washington and he wrote to the, um, those, uh, those, uh, the militant to say, hey, I, I, here's a change of, I, I'm going, I, there's a change of address, I'm moving to Washington. But that was, an, there was, a, I think, a plan to bring Oswald to Washington or an imposter, okay, so that if the assassination had taken place in Washington, they would have had Oswald the Patsy up there, okay, and there was actually sightings of an Oswald, and the witness who, who gave them the, the most clear description of this Oswald exiting a building and acting belligerent was the chauffeur, a chauffeur of a of a government uh, worker who was friends with Floyd Boring. Floyd Boring, who's one of the people of interest in, uh, with the Secret Service. So yeah. there's a whole story around, um, and that Vince Palomaro wrote about that sighting of Oswald. And he exposed a document that's so important uh, that everybody should read into. My last question before I cede the floor to anyone else. Um, um, oh, blimey, lost, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, oh, goodness me. Uh, no, I'm, it's gone. It may come back. It's my age. <laughs> <laughs> you can send me, you can send, you have my email now, so you can send me the question if ever you... Uh, okay, you thank you. Up. Oh, yeah, I just remembered it. <laughs> Dementia is a terrible thing. Um, the alleged photograph, I think I know what your answer is going to be. Um, the alleged photograph that shows Clay Shaw, uh, Ferry, and is it Oswald at a party in very strange, fancy dress? 
Um, do you think that? Do you think that's real? I mean, I think it is. I, they, if it isn't, there are some very, very good ringers for uh, those three people. But what's your opinion? I've seen that picture, and it, it just intrigues me. Um, I'm so um, hesitant, though, to put in, um, you know, to work on certain pictures, like, and and. and uh, you know, photography evidence. Uh, I like to try and stick to what's a slam dunk, you know, like what Malcolm Blanc calls chokeholds. And I, I just find that, you know, when you get into the, uh, you know, the picture of uh, Dogman or all of these things, or even the backyard photos, I think the backyard photos are cropped, I do. Uh, but I wouldn't write an article about it. You know, I just find that it, 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 you get into to even discussions among researchers who are arguing amongst one another uh, on that. So I, I, your opinion about that photo is as good as mine, but I do find it intriguing. I, I... The, the thing about photographic evidence pre um, to the digital age is that it's very difficult to refute it. I know you can argue that the backyard photos have been changed, etc. But when someone denies meeting someone else and you can produce a photograph that says, oh, you're there. It's like the Oswald and Ferry at the cookout. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. it. End, end of discussion. They, they knew each other. Yes, yes. And uh, Posner, you know, he had so much trouble with that one eh, when it popped up. Uh, and he had trouble with 544 Camp Street. I mean, that's 544 Camp Street is, is just a pain in the neck for anybody who's a known apologist. I think Mexico City is just devastating. I think what the Parkland doctors witnessed is devastating. You know, if you look at slam dunks, I think when you get into uh, Oswald Networks, Okay, and who he clearly knew, and and uh, you, and Ruby. I think, I, to me, there's about twelve definite chokeholds where you just can't argue your way out of it. Uh, you know, uh, and I found in the documentary what they did on the chain of custody around uh, what is it C three ninety nine. The uh, that that was remarkable because I always found that that whole single bullet was always destroyed by the trajectory, but to see it destroyed by chain of custody and by the lack of damage uh, to me was just, uh, even some of my brothers who don't believe in a conspiracy theory, when they saw that, said they said that bullet didn't do the damage they said it did. But <laughs> it, and also the, the, the spent cartridge cases at the Tippett murder had no yeah. chain of custody either because they didn't have the signature scratched in of the officer that picked them up. So this, if this ever went to court, it would have been thrown out immediately. Oh, by the way, the, the wallet uh, that uh, Neil, I think, was referring to, uh, that, that was identified to Vernon Phillips, who was the sponsor, okay, he was a sponsor of Marina and Marina's daughter. Uh, Jim Hargrove, who works with... Um, uh, John Arswald told me, no, that's his sixth wallet. It's not the fifth. It's the sixth <laughs> wallet that he had. And it had Vernon Phillips's identification in it and $180. Which for Oswald was a lot of money. Oh, <laughs> that's the other thing. Is this whole idea that he was frugal, you know, he's buying uh, stamping machines. He's buying flyers. He's hiring lawyers. He's paying fines. He's, uh, and he's penniless. And this whole idea that, that he had mo enough money to leave uh, to uh, Marina uh, after his death, it, it just doesn't make any sense. You know? Like if you look at, he goes to Mexico City, goes to see a bullfight. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it just, it just ludicrous. Well, the thing about the bullfight, of course, is there's an awful lot of bullshit on the floor. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Don't know if there are any other questions or or uh, 
anything you'd so look i i i'll be uh keep your eyes open for kennedy's and king that article will be out there and that's where you'll be able to get these documents i showed you and uh I don't know, maybe divide up the files a thousand pages each <laughs> or something. I don't know. But uh, have some nice reading there. I'm glad that Len is sharing that with you. Paul, did. Yes. There's a writer by the name of Michael Snyder who has a, <clears throat> excuse me, 16 page essay. I feel like a spring lamb, what Clay Shaw's literary life reveals. And he read that paper, John actually organized a conference in 2008 at the University of North Dakota on the 40th, 45th anniversary of Kennedy being at the university to receive an honorary degree. Well, it, the, the takeaway from the essay is that uh, Shaw was a noted playwright he even had uh, a play that he wrote in high school, uh, copyrighted and is still being performed all these lays, years later by community uh, play groups, uh, colleges, high schools, and uh, numerous plays. I didn't know he, that. He became acquainted with Gore Vidal uh, and other uh, Notable. Tennessee Williams, right? Yeah. Tennessee and, Williams. Uh, but but the long and short of it is it's it Michael Snyder makes it clear that Shaw's extreme anti-communism that starts to surface as a teenager, he hypothesizes that it carries through to his adult life. And the people he's associated with at the International Trade Mart are hardcore right-wing free traders and that Shaw fit right in. Well, Gary, uh, I thank you because uh, I found the, it's in the, in the uh, Shaw, uh, sorry, the uh, Garrison files, you will find the incorporation papers of the ITM, okay, and their mission. And one of their missions is to fight communism. Okay, the ITM. And uh, I, I later found a short history of the ITM that is not in the garrison files. And clearly, when you look at the mission of the ITM, you can see why he would finance Cuban exiles. I think the ITM was the conduit of money and resources to dish out in New Orleans sort of like Permindex did in Europe, okay? And I fully agree. No, he, he rabid right-wingers, as was David Perry, as was Guy Bannister, rabid right-wingers. And this whole idea that he liked uh, uh, Kennedy or, or, or whatnot, and, uh, I don't believe that, you know? That, yeah, uh, it's Michael Snyder's uh, uh, notion is that he was posing as a, an FDR liberal uh, and that was all uh, a facade in order to navigate through the right wing in New Orleans without giving himself away. Thank you for that. I find that very interesting. But he, was he, born, he, you, he was born wealthy in rural Louisiana, and uh, his, his uh, grandfather and father were law enforcement officers, and... Uh, but from a well-established famous family. And he rejected all that and became literally an important playwright. So that's very interesting. And uh, in the Garrison Files, the, uh, the um, sorry, the history of Clay Shaw is pretty well laid out, but I, I didn't read that. I don't remember reading that, but I don't think they went as far back as that. That's very, it should be added to our document. But uh, he had a pretty good profile of Clay Shaw, and it's really worth seeing what he did during the war years. Uh, what Clay Shaw did in the war years, uh, you know, and I mean, he avoided com combat, okay, and he was more into administrative work. 
But um, if you look also at the ITM, the, the founders of the ITM, there's a lot of intelligence. Cobb, you know Cobb, uh, the, uh, I forget his name, but he had the Maradale Farms, or it was his brother, he's CIA. Hetch, CIA. Uh, you have, uh, I forget, Stern. Stern is related to WSDU, okay? And these are all key people on the ITM. So if you look at who the occupants were of the ITM, some of the first tenants, I didn't tell you this, but you know where Arcacha Smith and one of these organizations, I think it was the uh, Free Cuba Committee or the Crusade, I forget which one, but they had their offices in the ITM. Okay, mm -hmm. and when people would go uh, often raising money and collecting money, some of the young people, they'd go into the ITM. Okay, and you, you I, I'm trying to get, I think if someone would work on someone they're really close to New Orleans and we say, hey, let me look at these files and let me look at the names and let me find out who is who and who are the first tenants of the ITM, you'll see that it was very intelligence related. Uh, Gaudet, remember Gaudet, uh, who um, uh, he had, he was publishing a newspaper uh, uh, for the ITM and for um, uh, you know, it was promoting, uh, you know, uh, anti-Castro uh, propaganda. Well, he was based in the ITM and he links right to Oswald, right? Because he was what, right after Oswald, when Oswald asked for his uh, passport or visa to uh, Cuba. Uh, so there's so many, so many uh, links there that you can find. And you, uh, these names, again, you saw that list of names of people who went to Camp Street. We're already seeing interesting names that linked to Oswald. But if you look at the ITM names, another series of names that are really interesting are those linked to Inca, the International Council of the Americans. You know that Philbrick is a, a contributor to Inca. Philbrick, who was Oswald's idol, uh, the actor in I Led Three Lives. Uh, you have uh, people linked to Inca who are linked to the trademark, who are linked to the Riley Coffee Company. So it's all one big network down there that we can unravel if we look at the names and we start saying, okay, this is how the ITM links to uh, the Riley Coffee Company. And here's how it links to, you know, when, uh, when you think of who founded one of the organizations, okay, the I forget the name of the organization, Gary, you may know it, but that, that it was that organization that tried to buy the Jeeps, okay, under Oswald's name uh, to buy Jeeps. And Oswald was in Russia, but they were using the Oswald name. Well, the founders of that, or, or the people who signed on the um, launch of that, doc, uh, that organization, which was, I think, the Free Cuba Committee or something like that, well, you have Guy Bannister who signs off on that and Gerald Tuhig, where Oswald had worked, okay, Tuhig in the summer before he went to uh, Russia or in the summer was one, sometime. So you get this organization, you know, where you, 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 you see these impossible links, okay? And that's, that's what, what's fun with some of these files. You saw that document there with the names of the Rodriguez. Remember those names, the three from the Rodriguez family, they are key. They are key names in the assassination uh, plot, I'm sure. And uh, Bill Simpich and, and Larry Hancock know more about them. Wasn't it Inca that put out the LP <laughs> record of Oswald um, in a debate with Carlos Bringuer? Oh, he, the day one, Inca, uh, Ed Butler yeah. sent it right up to Washington and he was invited up as a witness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they they funded the release of the record. So, oh, yeah. You know, why, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, look, here's the thing. In that debate, think of this. You have Oswald, who's part of the FPCC, right? Who has the job of um, monitoring the FPCC for the CIA? You guys know, if you had to give a name, who is the person in charge of monitoring the FPCC for the CIA? Matthew? I don't know. David Atte Phillips. 
Okay. On the left, that might, you that have sense. okay, David Atley Phillips. Who has the who launched the DRE? David Atley Phillips. Okay. And who used Inca and knew Ed Butler? David Atley Phillips. Who knew the Rodriguez brothers? Okay. And uh, when Rodriguez, you know, when Oswald goes to Mexico City, David Atley Phillips. Okay, and if you look at the touch points between David Atlee Phillips and Oswald, it's insane. There's a link between David Atlee Phillips and George Morinfield. There's a link between David Atlee Phillips and let me and some of the Alpha 66 people that see Oswald. He was instrumental with Alpha 66, and I'm talking about Vesiana and uh, people like, I mean, so if you look at these touch points, Okay, that's what I'm saying is I think we're not far from being able to say, here are people of extreme interest. And you'll see David Atlee Phillips is one there. Uh, I've written a lot about him. And I would have my eyes set on that person, not necessarily as a top dog. But. Um, well, he, he was, if, he, if he wasn't top dog, he was certainly quite high up. I mean, he had a finger in every pie. Um, and he was doing important work. Um, but it's amazing that we've managed to piece these threads together. After all these years, with all the, all the redactions and all the cover-ups and all the destruction of documents, and it just again highlights what a absolutely shit performance the Warren Commission did. Shocking, even if it wasn't a cover-up. If you just put it down to incompetence, shocking incompetence, and that was with the it was the ex uh, head of the um, um, the U.S. judiciary. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't Warren? know how anyone Warren. I beg your pardon, Earl Warren, of course, Warren Commissioner. Um, I don't know how anyone is even even disputes the fact there was a cover-up can even support any of the conclusions of the Warren report because it's 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 terrible and you know who says it's terrible in so many words it's the HSCA if yeah. you read the conclusions of the HSCA well the, <laughs> I mean, it, the official say, hey, position you... the official position is there was a conspiracy that is the official U.S. position and they have a lot of interesting things they say about Camp Street and uh, David Ferry's relationship with Oswald. There's an awful lot of, if you read them, that's why I say that we're not, the conspiracy theorists are really the ones who are saying there's a lone nut because they're saying the HSCA got it wrong. <laughs> okay, they're saying, so the HSCA is publishing false information to, <laughs> to the public. We're, we're, that's what I'm trying to say is we are not the conspiracy theorists in here. When you have, an investigation body of the U.S. and all these insiders, Schweiker, Gary Hart, uh, Tannenbaum, Sprague, these are the top dogs, Blakey. If, look how, who signed the bloody um, uh, petition there lately to say, hey, reopen it, there's a conspiracy. I mean, you know, it, 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 so to be painted as a, uh, you know, sort of a, a lunatic conspiracy theorist, so we Bogliosi did, it's not true. They're the ones in this case that are saying there's another form of conspiracy where the HSCA participated in it, and including all these insiders. Bugliosi is an in Sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say my my I, my thinking on on what went wrong here is uh, what one of the things that went wrong is that the plotters didn't mind admitting to a front shot. As a matter of fact, they would have said the front shot came from a guy like Harry Powers, Jack Lawrence, or Polycarpo Lopez. They would have found a link to, uh, they wanted to link it to, uh, to uh, Castro, okay? And that was planning because they wanted the excuse to invade the island and say, hey, look, Castro killed our president, let's go, you know? But the second, you turn around and say, no, no, we're not going that route because it could start World War III or a nuclear war. It becomes impossible to cover that up. 
now you have to explain the Zapruder film. You've got to explain Jack Ruby. You've got to explain uh, what the Parkland doctors saw. You have to explain all that stuff. And you, you know, so it, it just turned into a mess. Uh, but they were just under orders say, hey, look, clean it up, clean it up. We're going the loan that road, but there's just too many, too many things. Uh, you know, the, 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 I think they would have had an easier time saying there was a conspiracy, but look, the guy who shot from the grassy knoll was so-and-so who's also connected to Castro. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you I was going to say about Bugliosi, I follow the Manson murders, and oh, yeah. uh, of course, Bugliosi wrote Hell to Skelter, which is, and it was the prosecutor, and that's supposed to be the ultimate version of events. But Tom O'Neill has done a recent, a good book on the Manson murders called Chaos. And he's dug up some shocking information on Bugliosi as a person and as a lawyer. Um, he was, he had multiple affairs. He had uh, illegitimate children. He threatened people. Um, the guy is a shambles. Um, how he can be uh, regarded as anyone credible is beyond words. I mean, the guy has, has destroyed his own reputation. Oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't read that book, but I heard uh, Jim DiEugenio's mm -hmm. takedown of uh, Bugliosi, uh, which he did really well on Black Op Radio, and he, he wrote it, of course, as part of reclaiming Parkland, and, you know, the, so it's a really important part of his book, <clears throat> is to, is to uh, show how he, uh, you know, uh, how the whole Manson murder uh, trial was a sham. But uh, I think chaos, from what you're telling me, seems to go into a lot of details that I, didn't heard, I never heard yeah. of. Um, yeah, and he he's uncovered an awful lot of important information. Uh, just like the Kennedy case, a lot has been suppressed. Um, there are tapes, original tapes, with interviews of the members of the Manson family have never found the light of day even though they definitely exist. Um, again, it, you just, I'm not saying, I mean, I'm, I, it, demonstrably they were involved, you can't argue otherwise, but I think there's, there's a lot behind it, there's more to it. it. And if there's nothing to hide, why not release them? Oh yeah. Hey, so hey, Jay, I know some people are signing off. Thank you so much. I'm still available, but uh, thank you uh, for those who are signing off, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure talking to you. I agree with you. Do you have an opinion on the uh, Epstein death? Not particularly. I don't know enough about it to be to be honest. I uh, I can't form an opinion. I'm not an expert, and I haven't read enough about it. I, I haven't read that much, but to me, that he died, that the cameras weren't working, that the guards weren't looking at him, that he was suicidal, and that just nothing's come out from all those tapes he had. Like, I mean, he had tapes in every room there. Where are they? Yeah. Where are yeah. those tapes? Yeah. Where are they? Who's got them? Yeah. So there's stuff it's happening the there, and, and uh, Maxwell is just taking so much time, and, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, think there's, uh, I think there's too much political stuff there, too, but I, I don't know. Even even Hess's death has a huge cloud over it. Rudolf Hess in Spandau Prison. Oh yeah, yes. Um, a lot of that doesn't add up. Um, records of who was who was the guard on duty have gone missing. Um, again, and no one seems to care. No one seems to say, you know, why don't these things exist? Maybe a question for me to you. Do you how do you think uh, Ukraine is going to play out? Uh, do, do you, is, is this, uh, I mean, we, we're just scratching our heads. Uh, many of us here saying, well, what the heck is the end game here? You know, like, <laughs> you know, like well, uh, I'm not, I'm not without wanting to take sides or whatever, but do you have an opinion on that or? Well, I, I predicted very early on that Putin would go in because he, he's a hard man. And he built it up so much he couldn't back down. If he backed down, he would have been nothing in the eyes of the Russian public. So he had to go in. Now, how it plays out now, he has to have a way out. He has to save face. Now, whether that is 